joined by uh, that uh, Matt McManus, who's who's pretty much the guy on. Uh, or no, actually, I don't, I don't even remember who this is supposed to be. I remember there's a throwaway gag in The Simpsons once where uh, there was somebody on uh, Kent Brockman's show who said, you know, I brought my own mic, you know, that's because uh, they were uh, on all the time. Uh, and uh, Victor Brazon, uh, who uh, has been on before, not that often. Uh, and um, the our uh, our new producer, uh, Jake uh, Appet. Uh, so, uh, it's, you know, whatever. It's like being the drummer on Spinal Tap. Don't worry about him. He'll, you know. <laughs> Be replaced in a week. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, if he was the drummer in Rush, then yeah, there'd be a bit of a worry, but you know, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, so, uh, we are uh, gathered here today to uh, talk about a new book from Palgrave Macmillan uh, that uh, Victor and I both have essays in and uh, Matt edited, uh, showing you right there. Uh, it's called Liberalism and Socialism. Mortal enemies or embittered kin, uh, which is a uh, which is a good uh, a good title. So, uh, Matt, why don't you tell us about the book? Sure. I mean, um, one of the prompts for this book uh, was actually a series of articles I had written for things like Aereo and then one or two for Jacobin, talking about the intersection between liberalism and socialism. Uh, both, you know, the big stark differences between them, but also some of the surprising overlaps between them conceptually and historically. Um, and what really struck me uh, is there were two critics uh, who I got uh, that pretty much were emblematic. Uh, one of them were right-wing critics who said, how dare you slander the glories of classical liberalism by trying to associate it with socialism. We can't have that. Socialism stands for everything that's degenerate and bad, liberalism, or at least a kind of possessive individualist liberalism for everything that's good. Uh, and then there were also people on the left who had exactly the same reaction, but just from a different ideological perspective, which is how dare you slander the good name of socialism by associating us with liberalism. We want nothing to do with that. Liberalism is associated with everything bad and terrible, and we don't want anything to do with it. Socialism, everything that's good. Uh, and this book was kind of an opportunity to explore a little bit of that in more depth than what I've been able to over the course of those articles. Uh, but not, in, not wanting to do that alone and not being capable of doing it alone, I decided that I was going to bring in some hired guns, uh, which is why Ben and Victor and a whole smorgasbord of other people offered contributions. So if you're looking for a good panoramic look uh, at liberalism, socialism, and the debates between them historically in the 21st century, you could do a lot worse than our volume, uh, which I guess will be my sales pitch for the day. Uh, yeah, fair enough. I don't, I don't know if, I, uh, if I'm comfortable doing an actual sales pitch because academic publishing being what it is, is not cheap. But, uh, you know, they do watch the website. They do sometimes do sales where it briefly becomes cheap. Uh, and also, you know, I mean, the big thing I would say for the academic stuff is just like tell your library to get it. Uh, yeah, if the yeah. editor's not listening, which I hope he's not, uh, definitely don't buy it full price. Uh, buy it when it goes on discount or get it from the library, okay? Uh, don't tell him if you ever contact him that I said that. If I said it, if you see him, uh, I told you to buy it at full price. Uh, and if anything, to add a tip to Palgrave. <laughs> Christmas time's a good time to check because I've noticed that they go on sale on Palgrave around Christmas Boxing Day. Nice. Palgrave take tips, that, that'd, be, uh, that'd be unusual. They had well, you know, similar. I'm always willing to take one on their behalf if anybody wants to make a donation to the Matt McManus uh, Liberal Socialist Fund, right? Yeah. Uh, it's the uh, Matt McManus Best Cal Fund last time I knew, but um, maybe maybe now that you're back in Canada is less. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I guess I guess one way of of approaching this a little bit uh, would be to disambiguate. Uh, different things that people mean by liberalism, because I think this is where a lot of confusion comes in, because I don't think it's hard to come up with something that's like, you know, some people at some times and places have met by liberalism that makes like, you know, the uh, it clearly true that liberalism is completely incompatible with socialism. And I also don't think it's, it's that hard to come up with things that it can be that that's not at all true of. Uh, so... Like just just a like a first pass at that. Uh, 
I mean, there, there is a sense in which I think if any of us uh, said that like, oh, that sounds like a really liberal, you know, take, you know, that that's not a compliment. Uh, and uh, and if, if, you know, like I, I might have even occasionally used the word like rad lib, like, you know, somebody, somebody says something that's like, you know, it's like, you know, there's a sort of veneer of radicalism, but, you know, it, it, it seems to be, you know, it seems to be indicative of liberalism in the bad sense of liberalism, but also like, okay, at least one thing that liberalism can mean and sometimes does mean is just thinking that a bunch of the sorts of rights that we usually think of as liberal rights are really important. Uh, you know, free speech and freedom of association and freedom of the press and, and et cetera. And like, yeah, I mean, in, in that sense, uh, clearly, yes, that that's, that's something that like, there are, there are visions of socialism that's not compatible with, but not ones that I want to have anything to do with. Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree. Uh, and I should say that in the book uh, and then elsewhere, I tend to distinguish between two conceptions of liberalism, uh, one of which is good and one of which is bad, you know, to cut past all the bullshit. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to say before I get into that, uh, and then maybe Victor wants to chime in before I go on my long rant, uh, is that I actually think it's easier to pin down. Yeah, everybody knows me, knows me. I have my wrong rants, right? Um, is that I think it's easier to actually pin down a working definition of liberalism and socialism than it is to pin down a working definition of conservatism. Uh, and that's because, and this will actually break us into the conversation, liberalism and socialism are modernist doctrines that are founded on certain principles uh, that they hold to one way or another, right? Uh, and to a certain extent, we'd say that if you break too far from those principles, whether you call yourself a liberal or socialist, you're not, right? There's a kind of essential quality to your political doctrine. Conservatism isn't quite like that. Uh, it has more of a practical quality to it uh, in the sense that it's a defense of power, but power looks very different in different circumstances. So the kind of intellectual defenses that have been mounted on its behalf can be extremely variant uh, compared to the intellectual defenses of liberalism and of socialism, uh, which tend to be not more uniform, uh, but definitely more consistent uh, in terms of the kinds of claims that liberals and socialists will make about human nature, the kind of things that we should aspire to, what a good society would look like, and all the lot. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And I would also say that I think oftentimes the like, especially on online, like sort of political discussion spaces, we see a tendency to sort of uh, um, conflate like liberalism with support for capitalism, support for unfettered capitalism. And I think like, you know, I would at least argue and, and uh, that I don't think that that's necessarily at the core of liberalism. I mean, I see why like things like, um, you know, freedom of uh, freedom of speech and, you know, like property rights, I guess they, they do get sort of like conflated a lot, but I think it's easy to just like say, okay, if you're a liberal, that means you're like for capitalism immediately. And like, you're kind of ears close. And I think like part of the, the, probably the idea of the book that hopefully gets across is to maybe, um, go against that narrative a little bit. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I, I mean, I guess also I'd say that property, like, that traditional association of free speech and property rights is probably less plausible in uh, 2021 when uh, certainly in, you know, Western societies with reasonably good free, you know, very imperfect, but reasonably good free speech protections where uh, like all of the big battles about censorship are all about, you know, private institutions like YouTube. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I absolutely. Think, yeah. So, um, I, I guess one way of thinking about this, uh, by the way, Silver Harlow says, while we're doing disambiguation, uh, confused about social democracy, and democratic socialism, uh, I, uh, I, I, I do, I do have a, uh, an annoyingly specific take on that, but if, if anybody wants to jump in, you know, feel free. Um, so I, I, I just I just say that like social democracy, the confusing part is that historically social democracy was just a synonym for socialism up until like World War One and the Russian Revolution and all that, you know, extended democracy into the social realm, uh, you know, the economy. But uh, as, you know, after the splitting off of the communist movement, you know, from, from traditional social democracy and a bunch of other stuff, uh, this is the level of historical analysis you're going to get here, a bunch of other stuff, you know, things happened. 
Uh, and as a result of those things, uh, the you know social democracy more and more came to be used as a term not for the kind of workers' democracy that might come after capitalism, but for like doses of socialism administered within capitalism, uh, you know, Medicare for all, stuff like that. Uh, and and so I'd, I'd say that like somebody who's a social democrat, strictly speaking, that their their horizons don't go beyond those doses of socialism within capitalism, and somebody who's democratic socialist in a richer sense than that, so they, they want the form of socialism they advocate is democratic. It's not like Stalinism, but uh, but they do advocate going beyond capitalism entirely. What they're going to advocate in the short term right now in 2021 is probably going to be pretty, you know, I mean, it's, it's social democracy, right? I mean, that's, that's what can be achieved right now. But I, but if there's a difference between those two things, it's in what the uh, the horizon is, you know, like, like which, which is probably not unimportant even in terms of achieving those short-term things. Like quite a bit of the, like what, you know, welfare states and labor movements, you know, that have been achieved around the world have been achieved by people who had some version or another of those long-term horizons and, Arguably, you kind of need them to uh, to like stick with it in the long term, and not just you know not just get uh, demoralized. Um, but yeah, so Matt, you were talking about uh, conservatism and conservatism sometimes being harder to define, and it, and it seems like one reason for that is that conservative is that like you know oftentimes like the figure we think of is like the founding father of conservatism is Edmund Burke. And what Burke is is conserving is the like what's left at the end of the 18th century of the Ancien Regime, you know, and, and he's he's conserving it from capitalist revolution, and that's that's done, right? That happened, you know. That's that's not, uh, uh, no, you know, absolutely nobody. I mean, you know, not absolutely nobody, right? Cicero says you can always find like there for any, there's no proposition so absurd, some philosopher somewhere doesn't defend it, and. There's certainly no proposition so absurd someone on Reddit doesn't defend it, but um, but you know basically nobody advocates going back to feudalism at this point. So you're. I mean, well, you say that I've seen a couple of the frog people uh, for whom they wouldn't quite say that overtly, but when they start defending Louis the Sixteenth, Louis the Fourteenth, and all the other Louis, and saying, "Wasn't it so great when we were relieved of the burden of politics, and the king just told us to go fight and die for some duchy on the other side of the Rhine?" Uh, you know, everything was a lot better. I get like, uh, yeah. yeah, and my my, my pro feudalism sentiments is when it's what's gonna get gonna get me kicked off eventually. I think so. They'll come at us. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no. When, when the uh, when the pro Louis Sixteenth sentiments really start up, you know, it's gonna be it's. Uh, you know, Jake makes his uh, his twentieth comment about how he's uncomfortable with the the name Jacobin. You know, uh, then uh, then yeah, it's gonna be a problem. But um, sorry, Matt, you were saying. Yeah, actually, I, th I think this is actually a good point to start to lead in to what I think the distinction is between liberalism and conservatism, and then we can start talking about liberalism and socialism, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, F.A. Hayek actually wrote a really good essay on this, and it's the only time I'm ever going to praise F.A. Hayek because I actually think we should be extraordinarily critical of him and everything he stands for. But he wrote a really good essay called "Why I Am a uh, Why I'm Not a Conservative," right? Uh, which might seem very odd because a lot of people on the political right like him, uh, and there are good reasons for that that we'll get into because he's basically the ideologue of uh, possessive individualist liberalism, you know, uh, which I think again all socialists have to condemn very virulently. Uh, but what he says in this essay uh, is that right-wing uh, liberals reject the conservative position uh, that in any society there are recognizably superior persons whose inherited standards and values and position ought to be protected and who should have a greater influence on public affairs than others. Uh, and I would argue that what makes someone a liberal, even a right-wing liberal, is precisely this denunciation of the idea that there are, quote, recognizably superior persons, people who are superior by nature, allocated superiority by God, uh, who have a, or who have even a kind of aesthetic superiority to them. Now, this is an uncomfortable position for Hayek, because uh, later on he's going to try to argue that, in fact, some kinds of capitalists are actually superior people in a certain sense, uh, but they're superior because they contribute to the overall aggregate utility uh, in society in a way that other people don't, which means they should be consequently rewarded for that. Um, but they're not recognizably superior in the sense that a conservative would understand someone to be recognizably superior uh, 
because you know, they were born Louis the Sixteenth, you know, the King of France, uh, or because God decided that their ass is the one that should be seated on the throne and not everyone else's, right? Right. Yeah. So, you know, if you're a conservative, uh, you know, you want to, uh, you know, conserve some sort of existing institutions or maybe go back to some that, that you feel like you've lost. Corey Robbins says that the going back is actually the essence of the whole thing, you know, the feeling that you had power and then you lost it and you want it back. Uh, that's that's what makes them the reactionary. Uh, but what it is that you're conserving or trying to go back to is is gonna vary, right? Uh, so you that uh, what, uh, you know, William F. Buckley even like, you know, what he wanted to conserve or go back to, you know, was not entirely what Edmund Burke, you know, uh, you know, wanted to conserve or go back to like, like Buckley, you know, I mean, there's, there's some like, um, you know, there's, there's some like weird, like, uh, you know, Catholic social traditionalist stuff in there, but like also basically he likes markets and, you know, and, and, and he believes in markets and he wants markets to run everything, you know, which was, exactly the thing that the the revolutionaries that you know that Burke didn't like you know were were all about you know at the at the end of the 18th century uh but if uh and, and so it can be a little harder to state like the point of conservatism in a principled way right because because what's the you know like you know you don't want to say oh here's some principle that's so important that we should remake society to the extent that it doesn't you know that it doesn't adhere to the principle or then you know your position is going to very quickly get not very conservative but uh but liberalism you certainly do so uh so if we're talking about uh philosophical liberalism broadly speaking uh which is also an important distinction to make because there's like you know you think okay there's liberalism in the view as the view that liberal rights of some sort really matter and then uh there's liberalism as a contemporary political position, you know, what, what we all mean, we talk about the libs. Uh, so, you know, roughly something to the right of social democracy, but the left of conservatism. Uh, but there's also philosophical liberalism. You were going to say that? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I mean, this is one of the things that I um, distinguish in the book, right? Uh, which is that we need to be really careful here and uh, distinguishing the kind of liberalisms that emerge and the forms of principles uh, that they all embody, right? Uh, so I think that if you think about right-wing liberalism, uh, what you're thinking of is a very possessive individualist kind of liberalism, one that's very centered on the idea, not that there are recognizably superior people, but that there will be very stratified social hierarchies. Uh, these are going to be established through market relations and backed up by the state enforcement of property rights, very stratified property rights, uh, and that this is a good and just kind of society. Uh, and some very right-wing liberals, like Hayek in his more Nietzschean moments, uh, or Ludwig von Mises in his more fascist moments, will even start to flirt with the idea that even if people aren't recognizably superior, the market does sort the superior people upwards uh, and the inferior people downwards, right? Uh, now, that doesn't mean that they're inherently superior, but through their efforts, they rise uh, or they fall, right? Uh, whereas the more left-wing you go in liberalism, uh, the more you start to see less emphasis on this kind of possessive individualist competitive liberalism that sorts people, uh, more an emphasis on the intrinsic connection between equality and freedom, right? Uh, and the way that I frame it in the book is that left-wing liberals, uh, like John Stuart Mills, uh, late John Stuart Mills, I should say, you know, I'm a socialist, John Stuart Mills, uh, John Rawls, who's also a liberal socialist, Chantal Mouffe, uh, their argument is that actually the principle of equality bequeaths the principle of liberty because there's this idea that since we're all moral equals, uh, no one has an intrinsic right to try to compel me to act in a certain way. Uh, if you want to put it in more technical terms, to embrace their vision of the good life. Uh, and since a lot of conservatism has been about trying to compel people to adopt a vision of the good life that conservatives think is the appropriate one uh, and to rank people accordingly, this is what needs to be rejected uh, in favor uh, of a more egalitarian kind of principle. And usually associated with that in the kind of liberals that I like and that I would kind of endorse is an argument that since people are moral equals, there's something intrinsically wrong with high levels of material inequality uh, or even any kind of material inequality unless there's a very, very strong justification for it, to use Rawls's term, um, in terms of you know taking care of the least well off or providing for the least well off. And we can get into that, but of course, when I argue that there are conversations that liberals and socialists can have, uh, 
uh, that can be constructive, the kind of conversations we're talking about are between these left-wing liberals uh, and socialists, definitely not possessive individualist liberals and socialists uh, who just need to really be confronted uh, and beaten down. Yeah, that's interesting. It kind of um, highlights the fact that like, to, like the way when you were talking there about like the sort of conservative liberals, it seems like, you know, like conservatives in those cases are just using liberalism as like a convenient foil in order to, to protect a certain form of hierarchy. Right. And I think to some extent, like nowadays, what's interesting about conservatism is that like it seems like there's a lot of like contemporary post-liberal conservatives who are kind of like letting go of that because they're feeling like, OK, actually, like free markets aren't necessarily like getting us the types of hierarchies that we want to protect, that we want to conserve. So maybe capitalism and free markets aren't actually such a good thing, which kind of goes to the fact that conservatism is such a kind of context, both maybe like geographic and historical, historically context dependent ideology. And maybe it, I mean, also I'm thinking it has to do with hierarchies to some extent, like like protecting some form of hierarchy anyway, seems to be a pretty consistent pattern in, 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 in all the different versions of conservatism. Yeah, right. I mean, that's the, that's the Robin analysis, right? That it's, uh, that it's not really about, uh, temporal orientation, you know, whether you like things the way they were in the past or not, because, uh, you know, which is the sort of thing that gets people twisted into thinking that, like, I don't know, trying to, you know, preserve, uh, you know, unionized industrial jobs as conservative or stuff like that. It's it's really about what your orientation is towards hierarchies. Um, yeah, so that, that, definitely, that definitely makes sense to me. Uh, so... So Matt, in your definition, you know, of, of liberalism, I mean, to try to like rephrase a little bit, you know, they, it's so, if liberalism in the broad philosophical sense is about anything, it's, uh, it's about moral equality, thinking that, uh, that all people, uh, you know, are, and, like we got a bracket here that like the, the scope of people, you know, depends on whether we're talking about the 18th century or now, but you know, uh, like, like putting, putting aside those complications, you know, that like all people or all people who the thinker is thinking about uh, have the same moral status that, uh, that, that nobody, you know, nobody deserves to have good or bad outcomes or nobody deserves to have to be treated in a way that other people aren't treated because, of what you know, caste they're born into, or or what uh, whether they're you know hereditary nobles, or you know whether they're like born into the you know serfdom, so you know they have hereditary obligations to hereditary nobles, or or anything like that, right? And, you know, if if liberalism is about anything, it's about it's about rejecting stuff like that. The idea that uh, that there are that different people have you know morally should have different rights and obligations. Because of uh, because of who they are, who they're born into, something like that, uh, and put at that level of vagueness, like practically everybody is a liberal now. Like, well, th not some not some conservatives. I think that's an important point, right? Um, you don't usually see many conservatives nowadays will be as overt as claiming, um, you know, like Nietzsche or like Demetra or even like Burke. Once uh, Burke sometimes said. Uh, that there just are recognizably superior people, right? Uh, but you dig a little bit beneath the surface, and it's pretty clear uh, what the implications of a lot of their doctrines are, right? And actually, I think this is one of the things that I'd like to point out. The further down the political right uh, and the rabbit hole associated with that you end up going, uh, the more your liberalism does just start to become a fig leaf. And I'll give a really good example of that, right? Think about Ludwig von Mises, uh, who I think is the perfect fig leaf liberal, you know? Um, in the sense that he's committed to certain kinds of liberal rights and freedoms for some, uh, and nominally to small state, unless the kind of social hierarchy that he thinks is appropriate begins to decay, uh, in which case all of a sudden he can very quickly become a status, a la, you know, his claim, ironically, in the book Liberalism, that fascism has temporarily saved European civilization. And he really gives the game away uh, and flags his illiberal colors, if you want, in a letter he wrote to Ayn Rand, where he said, the great thing about your books, uh, and I would argue that this isn't a great thing uh, because there are no great things about our books, uh, is that you have the courage to tell the masses what none of them want to hear and no, no politician's willing to say to them, which is you are inferior. Uh, and any improvement in your situation that you have, you owe to those who are superior, you're superior. And if you don't realize it, it's just because you've been bamboozled by all the kind of bullshit that people are willing to tell you. Uh, 
right? That is not a liberal sentiment uh, in the pure sense of the world, even if it kind of has the fig leaf of support for markets uh, that gives it a kind of liberal veneer, right? Uh, so, yeah, so maybe this is a distinction worth making because I saw somebody, Silver, I guess, earlier brought up meritocracy. And, and there's, a, there's an interesting question here about the, how those ideas relate to each other because there's a certain way of thinking about it where, where meritocracy, the idea that some people deserve like, you know, I don't know, honors, a share of resources, whatever, that, that other people don't because they're smarter, better, you know, in, in some way, right? Uh, there's a way of thinking about it where that, that dovetails uh, with, uh, you know, with, with like some sort of liberal individualism where, where, you, where you think, well, uh, the whole the whole idea is just to have like an equal starting place, and 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 then we'll and then we'll award all of the uh, all of the richest daughters to the fastest runners, uh, but uh, but then that's that's very like, uh, but then there's also like a really obvious way in which like the way you just described philosophical liberalism, that would actually be incompatible with with meritocracy uh, that because. If, um, I mean, if some people, you know, if you don't want to, you know, like if the sort of basic reason why you don't think that some people should have uh, good things or, or different rights or obligations, you know, that, that other people, uh, because they're born into a certain caste or class or race, you know, or anything like that, is because those things are outside of their control. It's unjust to uh, punish people for things that are outside of their control then the same thing should apply to, to whether you uh, have whatever combination of skills helps you in a meritocratic rat race. Yeah, that, that brings to mind um, the distinction that G.A. Cohen uh, makes about like the different types of equality of opportunity. And, you know, maybe one of you will have to like get it straight for me, but I know like in the book, G.A. Cohen talks about like bourgeois equality of opportunity. And then there's like the different types. And I know that one of the things he tries to do in that book is to sort of like distinguish the sort of equality of opportunity that Rawls uh, defends versus like the kind that he wants to defend, which is like a lot more robust and I think includes almost everything. And maybe either Matt or Ben could, because it's it's not ready to hand in my mind. But that could be a useful uh, distinction to clarify. Yeah, so that's this book, uh, Why Not Socialism by J. Cohen. Uh, he uh, he talks. He just wet that out so quick, Ben. It was like fucking battering. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I get excited when somebody brings it up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, yeah, Cohen at, at the beginning of the book, he uh, he makes a uh, a distinction between like three or four conceptions of equality of opportunity. You know, people like to make a big deal of equality of opportunity, but he says it's it's really ambiguous what equality of opportunity means. And so says at the first rung, there's what he calls bourgeois equality of opportunity, which is basically just that you have uh, that. Uh, everybody has some sort of like official legal right to compete for, you know, offices, and honors, and riches, and all that stuff. So, so nobody is like, you know, you, you can't have like a cast of untouchables where if you're born into that cast, you know, you're not allowed to, you know, compete for certain jobs. Uh, and that's like the sort of thing, that's like the sense of equality of opportunity that like the people who made the French Revolution were about. Uh, but then it uh, says there's what he calls left liberal equality of opportunity, uh, which recognizes certain kinds uh, of, um, you know, like certain kinds of social disadvantages that people deserve to be compensated for, even if they're not like, uh, like official legal barriers. So uh, he gives the example of like Head Start programs as an attempt to carry out left liberal equality of opportunity. And so the idea is like, this is a conception of quality of opportunity where uh, even like it's not good enough to just have legal equality. You also can't have some like social impediment like you might have because you're, uh, you know, you're born into, you know, a family where, uh you know, your parents have to work all the time and they could never read to you or whatever, right? You know, like that, that would be the sort of example he has in mind. But he says, but then he says there's also uh, his own conception, which he calls socialist equality of opportunity, 
uh, which uh, which goes a step further. And I actually think Cohen, um, who's right about like ninety nine percent of everything, but is is like uh, you know is sometimes like. I think he's sometimes like just a little bit uncharitable to Rawls, so I think he might see you know interpret uh, uh, interpret Rawls as just doing the left liberal one. But I, I think I think Rawls in some ways is closer, you know, to what he calls uh, Cohen calls socialist equality of opportunity, uh, which is the idea that um, you shouldn't have unequal outcomes based on anything that's not under your control, which. Everybody can sort of nod along to that when you say it in the abstract like that. It's like, yeah, of course, if something's not under your control, you shouldn't have like worse outcomes be because of it. But you actually take that seriously and think about it for 10 seconds. That that's super radical because um any kind of of meritocratic anything, right, is is going to include stuff uh that's outside of your control. I mean, whether uh, whether you're, I mean, this is a very like Rawlsy way to put Cohen's point, but I mean, whether you're born into a um, like some sort of society that's where uh, your chance for social advancement is that you win a series of trials by combat to like make it into the warrior caste, or whether you're born into uh, 21st century America and your chance for advancement is that you have the particular set of social and cognitive skills that are important to you know, doing really well in school and climbing up the, you know, the, the PMC, you know, career ladder in either case, right? You don't choose to be really strong and have good reflexes. Uh, you know, those things can certainly improve with training, but like, you know, come on, right? Like that's, that's, it's, it's, it's not really the case that, um, you know, pick your, pick your favorite MMA fighter, right? That that guy and Matt like start out at exactly the same place and, and and that the only difference is training, uh, and um, I mean I surrender. <laughs> and, uh, and and the same, you know, this is the point Freddie DeBoer makes in Cult of Smart. You know, the same thing goes uh, for uh, for the like educational and career stuff in, in 21st century America. I mean, not everybody, you know, cognitive skills are like any other skills. You know, they're wildly unevenly distributed among people. I mean, like whatever you believe about what combination of genetics or socialization or whatever leads some people to, you know, to have the particular set of skills that lead them to, you know, do well in school and blah, blah, blah. You certainly don't get to pick, right? Nobody's, nobody's sitting there thinking, man, um, do I want to test well? Eh, nah, you know, I guess not, right? You know, I, 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 I prefer to, I prefer to have a lot of trouble, you know, internalizing information and et cetera, et cetera. Nobody does that, right? So if you really I say, mean, you say that in my undergraduate degree, I had a buddy. He and I were at a party. I didn't have school that day, so I was drinking a lot. Let's just put it that way. But he had an exam the next day, uh, and we all told him, like, fuck your lame exam, man. You should stay out. You should drink with us. And he just told me at that point, he was like, ah, I'm just going to fail the course. And I was like, actually, I don't think you should do that. We were kind of joking. He was like, eh. Failed the course. <laughs> and he later dropped out of the program and joined another one. He's fine, by the way. He has a nice house and everything, so it all worked out. But some people do select for that choice. Let's just put it that well, way. Under the well, right. Well, well even even technically your your work ethic is partially genetically determined, right? Like I mean, that's kind of the way that the markets are supposedly even in the fiction of uh, classical liberalism, I mean of the sense that, you know, how hard you work determines your outcome. You weren't necessarily born with the ability to have more initiative than anybody else, right? So it complicates to me that, that that complicates things as well. Yeah, Absolutely. and I think that's Rawls' point. Uh, there's a really good book by Michael Sandel called "The Tyranny of Merit," uh, where he points out that meritocracy is one of those mythologies that's kind of like Santa Claus. It's very fit, it's very fant uh, fantastic to believe in it. It's very warm and it fills us with all kinds of endearing feelings, uh, but we shouldn't really invest it with all that much significance when it comes to explaining why it is that people get Christmas presents, uh, you know, on December the 25th, or why it is that people wind up in the society in the place they do in society, right? Uh, and one of the things that he points out in the book is that the weird irony uh, of all the kind of defenses about meritocracy offered by the political right in America is that both the twin peaks uh, of 20th century liberalism as articulated by F.A. Hayek and John Rawls rejected uh, the idea that you could even have something like a meritocracy, which a lot of people on the right don't want to acknowledge, right? Hayek said, look, in a market society, uh, you might produce Hustler on the one hand, and Elias Wiesel, Holocaust survivor, might write Knight on the other. 
uh, and Hustler is going to sell more than Knight. And most of us would say that Eli Wiesel probably did something that was more meritorious uh, than the producer of Hustler, right? That learning about the Holocaust and imbibing those kind of feelings is a more aesthetically important activity uh, than looking at a pair of tits. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But, you know, the market decides who gets rewarded on that basis. So the producer of Hustler is probably going to get more money because people would rather look at a pair of tits than they would actually go through a 100-page novel or 200-page novel about somebody going through the Holocaust, which I can kind of understand at points, right? Yeah, and so that has so nothing to do with people's individual merit. It just has everything to do with who the market and what consumers decided to reward, right? Rawls goes from, from a very different perspective, and I thought Ben articulated this very well. But he kind of has three dimensions to this position where he says, look, if you think about all the morally arbitrary circumstances, and that's putting aside historical injustice, which in the United States, as elsewhere, is a huge topic, like right? absolutely massive, right? So we shouldn't put it aside. But let's just imagine uh, we genuinely did live in a society characterized by reasonable equality of opportunity that wasn't defined by mass historical injustice, patriarchy, racial inequality, you name it, right? He'd say for exactly that reason. First off, natural advantages and disadvantages tend to skew the game very heavily. Nobody did anything to warrant natural advantages or disadvantages that they have. They're settled by a genetic lottery. Then there's fortunate or unfortunate social circumstances. Everything from your parents deciding to read to you when you're a child to being first in birth order to, you know, your parents deciding to get you glasses at a right age so it's not hard for you to read. All of these can skew you uh, in the right direction. Um, and, you know, one of the things that you know people point out, if you want a really good example, is access to post-secondary schools is another big one. Not a coincidence that there are more people uh, at Ivy League schools who come from the top 1% uh, than from the bottom percent combined. I'm oh, sorry, bottom 50% combined, right? Social circumstances matter a lot. And then one of the things that Rawls points out that's the last dimension to that is even having a skill that can allow you to succeed in a market society depends a lot on that skill being cherished in that society. I'm a shitty hockey player, right? Uh, but say I was, you know, Wayne Gretzky or Sidney Crosby or whatever, right? That's a pretty valuable skill to have in Canada, right? And I could make a lot of money like that. If I happen to have been born uh, in Uganda or Sub-Saharan Africa, it wouldn't matter how good a hockey player I am. It's very unlikely that I'm going to wind up being a millionaire. So even if I have a skill and choose to develop it, I have to be fortunate enough to be in a society where people tend to reward that skill with some kind of honorific or monetary compensation, right? So you add all that together, the notion that people succeed or rise on their merits uh, or fall behind because of their demerits is really just baffling, right? It doesn't make any kind of conceptual sense and certainly not empirically plausible. So it's quite telling that both major figures in the liberal tradition on the right and the left disagreed with the idea that meritocracy was even possible. And yet you have people like Ben Shapiro and Herstein and Murray arguing that this is such a sacred ideal that even if it can't possibly exist, we nonetheless need to hold fast to it like it's some kind of highest obligation to do so. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I've read Knight. I'll, I'll, I'll probably most, in most contexts uh, pick the other activity. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, right. So, I mean, just, just to make sure that, you know, I mean, this is definitely – already there in what you just said, but I mean, just to make sure everybody's clear on it, I, I think a distinction that oftentimes gets lost here is that a lot of people, even even people on, on the left, um, spend most of their time on, uh, like, if, they, if you think about the meritocratic defense of like contemporary American capitalist, you know, hierarchies of distribution, as having two premises one is that um you know we live in a meritocracy and the other is is that merit meritocracy is just way to distribute you know power and resources uh probably even on the left most people spend their time like who do who don't buy that defense spent most of most of their time disputing the first premise that you know that, that we that we live in a meritocracy which you know i mean it's, it's very easy to to uh to dispute i mean you know megan mccain was on was on TV for years, um, and and like literally, uh, you know, you you could do you could just like cold call a random person and offer them a job on the View, and they would have done a better job, you know, than uh, than, than Megan did, you know. But but her last name was McCain, so clearly we don't live in a meritocracy. But the equally important point, and this is the you know the Rawls point, the Sandel point, the Freddie DeBoer point, you know, that that Matt is talking about, is that even if if we did. That wouldn't be a good thing, right? That would that like the uh, 
a, a truly meritocratic society would would uh, would be horrifically unjust. Uh, and uh, in fact, in some ways, maybe even more so. I mean, you know, like you know, if you've seen Gattaca, right? I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, they, they, that society is a pure meritocracy. That you know, that there's that you know, that people people who uh, who have uh, uh, you know, who have been bred to, uh, to, you know, genetically engineered to, you know, to have certain talents, you know, or are rewarded for having those talents. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I was, I was also kind of wanting to clarify, like going back to like the Rawls versus Cohen thing, because I was kind of curious about the equality of opportunity because it, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I, I understood that like Rawls actually would allow for more inequality of opportunity because like, I don't think, I think he, he still thought that people with greater talents, even though they didn't choose them would potentially benefit insofar as their, their flourishing would help the least well off or, or yeah. My mis- no, yeah. And, and yeah. whereas Cohen seemed a lot more radical about like, about like correcting for every inequality that was unchosen, even of talents. Whereas Rawls seemed to leave more space for them to kind of rise to the top uh, a little yeah. bit, as long as they helped the society. He, he shifted his opinion on that slightly later in life. Uh, so by the time you get to justice and fairness, pretty much everyone has uh, agrees that he kind of shifted to the left. But the argument for this in theory of justice was essentially that while you might not necessarily deserve more uh, for the exercise of your natural talents uh, in the sense that you're more meritorious, uh, nonetheless, it's fair to compensate you at a higher rate for the exercise of those talents if it can be demonstrated that doing so is conducive to the benefit of the least well off, which is really just a fancy way of saying, look, if you're a reasonably intelligent person and you decide you want to become a doctor uh, and we paid doctors the same amount as we did janitors, not that there's something wrong with being a janitor, right? But a lot of people choose to be a janitor because it's just easier and quicker to do that, right? Uh, so it's okay to sit there and offer more to people in order to become doctors, both for scholarships and then a higher salary uh, because, you know, in a state with socialized medicine that will then benefit the least well off because people go and perform life changing and surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean the person is more meritorious, uh, just that they've been fairly compensated for the exercise of their natural talents uh, and the fact that they benefited the society around them. Right. And you can take issue with that if you want. And people like Cohen do. Uh, I tend to think that there is a big question of incentives uh, there that is important to ask as socialists. Right. Uh, but it's worth noting that Lawls isn't saying uh, the way that somebody like Shapiro or even Hayek might say in some days that the doctor is better than the janitor. It's just that, or even that the doctor contributes more uh, than the janitor. It's just that we need something in order to fairly compensate this person to pursue a difficult career uh, so that they'll benefit the people below with, yeah. the, with their talent and abilities. Yeah, so, so Rawls, right, exactly. So Rawls doesn't think, at no stage of his career, does Rawls think that the, that, um, more talented people deserve uh, to be compensated more, like as reward for the talent. Uh, and and this is this is exactly where the where Matt's point about uh, you know like having the set of skills that would lead you to be a really good hockey player in certain societies. You know, I mean, if probably if you're born in like uh, you know. Like if you're, I don't know. I mean, if you're, if, you know, probably if you're born into like a shtetl in you know uh, uh, Eastern Europe and you know uh, you know pre pre emancipation, and it's like, well, you know, you could you could be a merchant or you could study the Talmud and like you know the the uh, your hockey playing skills are going to be completely unhelpful to you in progressing in either one of the available paths to you in life. Uh, but um, uh, and and from Rawls's perspective, there's nothing unjust about. Like, I mean, really, from nobody's perspective, is there anything unjust about the fact that, you know, if you have some talents that would be really rewarded in some societies, but you aren't born into that society, you're not going to be rewarded for it. But Rawls, unlike a lot of people, has a good explanation of why that's not unjust, because there's no, you don't deserve more just because you have you happen to be born with some talent. So the justification for paying people more, if there is one, uh, it, and he even in theory of justice, he leaves that just a little bit open, right? He says people in the original position might uh, allow for uh, for people to be compensated more for these things. Uh, is is just is that this is going to make the worst people, the, the worst off people, better off? That uh, 
if you, you know, as, as George W. Bush once said, you know, make the pie higher, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, you know, make it bigger is what he meant, uh, that um, you, you have, you know, somebody who does, um, you know, who comes up with some innovation that helps the society grow twice as much grain, you know, and they might not have done that if they didn't have, you know, extra compensation to pursue some career. Uh, clearly, it's it's better for the worst off people in that society that, you know, that that person got that extra compensation. So, um, yeah, Cohen uh, would not, sort of not agree with this, um, although I think there's also a little bit of a trick about what you mean by justice. So, um, Cohen would accuse Rawls of not differentiated enough between like what would be an ideally just society and what's like the most just, but you know, the most desirable society we could get to given certain human limitations or something like that, right? Which, uh, you know, Cohen thinks those are different questions in ways that Rawls isn't necessarily convinced that, that they are. Uh, one interesting thing, by the way, about this is that I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that Marx would actually be on Cohen's side of that argument. Because if you read the uh, critique of the Gotham program, uh, Marx says that you know, okay, the higher stage of social society, you know, when it gets, you know, the really advanced stage when technology is produced, so but you know, has has accelerated such a point. There's just universal abundance and we've we've come so far culturally from capitalism that people aren't as motivated, you know, by material incentives anymore. And, you know, we can just have from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. You know, you can just kind of everybody will just sort of pursue their own projects and there'll be so little work that still needs to be done by humans, that'll be enough. And there'll be so much super abundance, there'll be tons of go around. And so he thinks under those circumstances, questions of what counts as a just distribution of resources are just going to be irrelevant. Um, obviously, tons of super optimistic assumptions there. Yeah. But in the uh, in the lower phase of a social society, as it comes straight out of capitalism, Marx actually says that uh, you need to tie compensation to uh, the duration or intensity of labor as an incentive. Uh, and, and he even kind of says there's a certain sense in which this is unjust because you're rewarding you know, natural aristocracy, people just happen to be have, you know, like some people can work more or harder than others, uh, but he still thinks that you need to for the sake of incentives. So it's a little, you know, there's a little hint of, of, of proto roles there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And actually, I wanted to bring this up because I actually think it's, it raises an important point about the concept of merit uh, in liberalism uh, versus socialism, right? Uh, because one of the interesting things about Hayek's argument in the Constitution of Liberty that I referenced before, Circa Sendel, uh, is he actually argues that defenders of capitalism should stop talking about merit. Uh, and the reason, he says, is that, look, every time you draw this idea that capitalism is almost a theological system that rewards people according to what they deserve, not just what they're entitled to on the basis of what they produce from a utilitarian standpoint for the market, but what they really deserve, you play into the hands of people like what we now call vulgar Marxists to say, actually, the workers are the ones who produce most of the product. They're the ones who invest their labor with it and make everything that's good. So consequently, they're the ones who deserve more, right? And you can still see arguments to this effect where people will say, well, think about how hard the capitalists work compared to everyone else. Doesn't that mean they deserve to have more? These kinds of arguments. He said, just do away with that. That will always play into the socialist hands, right? But one of the interesting things I think about uh, in your terms to 21st century liberalism and socialism uh, is both people like Cohen and Rawls agree that talking about merit uh, in terms of a just social system is really just a very abstract way of theorizing about things that we'd be better weaning ourselves off of. Because the only people who now really talk about merit are people on the political right. Uh, and one of the interesting things about people on the political right, as Victor pointed out, like the post-liberals, is this notion of merit means that they're not actually committed to the hierarchy established to the marketplace in the sense that Hayek would have wanted them to be, because the concept of merit that they have is usually more important than their convictions about capitalist society. And if they think that a so-called free market isn't actually establishing the right kind of hierarchy, they're very going to quickly going to abandon their commitment to it. A very good example of this is the Bordertarians, right? Uh, where 
any consistent libertarianism or any consistent capitalism would say you should have something like open borders. I think Jason Brennan is right about that, right? Free market of labor. Uh, but the kind of people who will often speak most loudly about merit aren't committed to that because, of course, they think there's something unmeritorious about allowing people who don't belong here to come into here, right? Uh, or you can think, to go back to Ben's initial point, about all the fear that's now going on about how tech companies are too socially liberal, too progressive, too captured by PC feminism or whatever, and the state should intervene to do something about that. That's just another example of how this notion of merit that many conservatives hold to is now trumping their commitment to a kind of free market capitalism because they think these tech companies aren't establishing what we think is the proper hierarchy or they're ceding too much ground to more egalitarianism, so we need to stop it, right? Uh, so I think this is a very interesting point where we can see that Hayek was actually wrong and that merit uh, actually is a bigger threat both to liberalism and capitalism uh, than socialism is, because now most liberal, most sophisticated liberals and socialists would agree that there's really no point in talking about merit. It's just such an ambiguous, empty-headed kind of notion that if you're going to offer any kind of nuanced defenses of liberalism or socialism, you just need to chuck that and talk about something else, whether it's utility, rights, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, uh, just to loop back to what Victor was raising about uh, Cohen and Rawls, uh, should also say that part of Cohen's position is that uh, not only that um, not only that any kind of inequality of distribution that you don't uh, that is chose that doesn't result from free choices uh, and and Cohen is is actually a, a compatibilist by the way I mean, he, he does he does say um, you know like like there's actually in in why not socialism there's there's a line that's uh, like honestly kind of like irresponsibly dismissive of how, how hard a problem it is, but also funny where he's like, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah. And I, I, and I do think that like free will exists and come on. So do you let's, let's, let's not pretend uh, the, uh, uh, you know, says, you know, you come on, what you, you don't think that like conservative politicians who advocate social benefit cuts are responsible for their decisions. Of course you do. Now let's move on. So, uh, but, uh, but he, he not only, only, thinks that any inequalities that aren't chosen are ultimately unjust, maybe we might need them uh, for roughly Rawlsian purposes. But as long as we still have them, we haven't kind of gone all the way, you know, to, to, a, to a just society. But not only does he, does he think that, he actually thinks that even some inequalities that could potentially be justified by um, socialist equality of opportunity that, you know, that you don't have that, like it has to result in some way from your choices uh, he thinks even those should be limited by a principle of socialist community. So, uh, you know, he gives the example of, uh, you know, if you have like a nice car, but, you know, I don't know, you know, you're, uh, you know you, your wife needs to use it for something that day or it's in the shop or whatever. So like that, you know, so you have to take the bus. You wouldn't try to commiserate with somebody who has to take the bus every day. It's like, oh, this sucks so much. I have to take the bus today. You know, that I, I can't drive. You know, for obvious reasons, right? You know, you, you would you wouldn't do that. And and so he he says that's an example of the how like material inequalities stop us from being able to 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 be in community. You know, with with, with each other. So like ultimately, he's, he's going to be like any remaining like. Ideally, and he leaves open the door, says this like a hard engineering problem about how to construct a social society that's just the way we want it to be, and maybe we could never completely do it. But he, but ideally, like the range of like acceptable inequalities for Cohen is like you know very 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 slight. But whatever you think about that, I think it is also worth looping back and saying even when we're talking about Rawls. Um, like the tests that Rawls puts for morally acceptable inequality are crazy strict. Like it's it's very unlikely that there has ever been a society that would pass these tests uh, anywhere. No, and he's pretty expressive about that in Justice is Fairness, right? I mean, he actually has a quite an influential section in the center of the book um, that Edmondson makes a lot uh, of hay out of and his uh, John Rawls' Reluctant Socialist. Uh, which you actually recommended to me, Ben, and it's a great book, right? Uh, but one of the things that he points out to speak to the question uh, that was asked earlier about social democracy, right? Uh, as he expressly asked, would a social democracy in the vein of, say, Sweden or Norway or Denmark, in the sense of a social democracy, uh, adequately meet the, or sorry, uh, adequately 
embody uh, the two principles of justice, really three principles of justice. And he's emphatic about the fact that the answer is no, right? This would not actually be enough uh, in order to meet the principles of justice. Uh, and the reasons he says is it would still allow too many different inequalities predicated on morally arbitrary circumstances. And he actually allows a kind of different argument that I think is very Cohen-esque, uh, if you think about Cohen's uh, kind of revitalization from an analytical standpoint of Marxist theory of history and power, right? Where he says that one of the problems with social democracy is it would allow some people to have more pronounced abilities to use their political rights in particular, because it would allow some people who have more money uh, to be able to influence the political situation in which they live in a way that would devalue those rights for others, which I think is actually quite an interesting point in our era of, say, Citizens United, for example right? Because Rawls would just be emphatically against that. And so he says that social democracy isn't good enough for that. And I think there's good empirical reasons for that also. Uh, Bhaskar Sarkar talked a lot about this uh, in his book um, on socialism, right? Where he mentions how it is that in the social democracies uh, of the 1970s, you saw a movement away from just redistributed policies towards exactly socialist manifesto, great book, towards an effort to achieve something like real workplace democracy. And that's where the social democracies draw the line. They're like, well, redistribute as much money to you as we can, but you're not going to be able to control your workplace. That's where we say no, right? Um, but Rawls says, you know, that it's possible that either property-owning democracy or liberal socialism could meet the principles of justice. And then he kind of leaves it an open question as to which kind of equality uh, would actually be apt, right? Uh, so and I think with Evanson that liberal socialism uh, is the way to go. It's really the only kind of consistent way of realizing these principles. Yeah, it's really unclear what he means by property-owning democracy. Yeah. Um, like, like, I don't, like, I mean, like, actually, in terms of what, like, Rawls originally meant, I have no idea, right, in that Edison book, he basically says he doesn't know. You and I you both, know. right? I'm, I'm really, have never been clear on it. Um, I mean, I think something that would at least conceptually make sense to, I don't think this is probably what he meant, but something that would make sense to kind of stick in that slot, right, you know, because you think, because, like, what he seems to mean is, well, you can't have a society where some people, um, you know, kind of monopolize the means of production so everybody else has to work for them. Uh, so, so capitalism, even like capitalism with all sorts of social democratic welfare state, you know, limitations is, is out, right? But then what's, and he says, well, one of the things we can have is what he calls liberal socialism, but then he also says property owning democracy, whatever that is. And, uh, and by like, I think what would at least make sense conceptually within the argument is maybe like something like uh, John Romer's idea that uh, in a future for socialism that, um, which Romer thinks of as a form of socialism, but I mean, I, th I think, you, you know, isn't really what most people mean by socialism, that uh, you could have a society that you could have like an economic system that in many ways looks like what contemporary corporate capitalism, except that uh, stocks, couldn't really be bought and sold. Everybody would just like have like a certain number of shares that they that they were like assigned at birth, and and then you could like literally like trade them back and forth, but you could never increase or decrease your number. So like it's it's kind of um, so basically all of the economy works like the Green Bay Packers, you know that that everybody can you know that you can have. Uh, People can own shares, but nobody can own that many, and you know, and all of that. And maybe something like that would make sense for me. What he means when he says property owning democracy. If he doesn't mean that, I don't know. I mean, or or maybe he's just talking about a less industrialized society where you can just have like mostly small holders. Uh, maybe it's not that well thought out, but yeah, I, I think it. Uh, I think he probably doesn't. Um, yeah, it's not that clear, but he does he does definitely say something like that where people are like start off with a certain amount of property. Um so yeah, I mean that sounds consistent, but you're right, it's not really that clearly laid out and explained in the text. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. But by, by the way, Jay Hutch, uh, I do agree with you. It was the most pointless and boring election uh, in recent years. Uh, I volunteered for the NDP throughout it. Uh, and I am happy that we gained a very very small number of seats and marginal uh, seats. It looks like there. Yeah, F1. But yeah, I can't say that it was uh, all that meaningful in the end when we basically went around in a big circle and wound up back where we started. Um, with small yeah, A little wiser, just, maybe. 
the Canadian election, of course. And actually, my favorite take about that was just this. There's a commentator, uh, Chantal Bear, and she said something like an election that nobody wanted. Nobody got what they wanted because like none of the parties gained. Everyone stayed exactly the same. No one accomplished anything that they wanted. Yeah. But yeah, so I, absolutely. Um, actually, I was working for 15 hours yesterday uh, at Elections Canada, which is a very long day. And if I seem kind of manic at this point, it's just because I'm still recovering from the sheer amount of caffeine I needed uh, in order to get me through that day. Wow. Uh, and all the people who just came and asked me, like, where am I supposed to vote? You know, sign. Um, but a- anyway, just, just to that point, I, I agree with everything that you said. Uh, I don't think that Rawls is very clear at this at all. To be fair to the guy, because I like him a lot, he did die uh, very, very shortly after writing this book. If he had lived a little bit longer, who knows? Maybe we would have got a manifesto at this point. Uh, but the way that I tend to cash this out is the reality is Rawls did, did not have a very sophisticated or interesting account, either of democracy uh, or of political power. Um, and I think this is where we need to kind of discard our liberalism to a certain extent and embrace a more Marxist dialectical approach uh, to an analysis of society. Because I think that one of the things that democracy is very good at is decentering and destabilizing systems of power, uh, particularly if we think about something like workplace democracy, for example. Uh, that's why I've often put it forward as not just a compliment, but a necessary compliment. Uh, to achieving something like the Rawlsian project, because I don't think if you have if you fail to have something, I think if you fail to have something like workplace democracy, you're very unlikely to get a society that meets the two principles of justice or three principles of justice, if you prefer, over the long run, because eventually power is going to reconcentrate in the hands of a few people, and they're invariably going to use that in order to hedge things to their advantage. Right? Again, he seemed to be slightly cognizant of that when he acknowledges that look, you know, the problem with social democracy is that people have. Uh, inequitable access uh, to political power, and they can exercise their political rights in ways that are sometimes more meaningful, which is why we need liberal socialism. But he never really said that much about it. Uh, and I think our job uh, in trying to reconcile elements of liberalism and socialism is to say that if you really want a society where all people are free and equal, what that's going to require is a commitment to a kind of workplace democracy and the broader democratization of the economy uh, and the power associated with it. So stopping Rawlsians at a point, uh, become Marxists at some point. <laughs> what the yeah, threshold that, is, I don't know, but we can all talk about it. Advice, yeah. and, actually, and actually back to the book, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm curious, uh, Matt, did you actually write a paper for it? Or did you just write the intro, in, an introduction for it or just put the essays together? I did. I wrote actually, my editor is going to kill me, but I'm not very happy with it. But I wrote the first essay. Uh, what does it mean to say all are created equal, liberalism and socialism on basic rights? Uh, yeah. It was my first kind of attempt at uh, taking a stab at some of these problems. I'm not really fully satisfied with it. Uh, a month later, um, I submitted another paper to a journal that was accepted that I'm a lot happier with. So it's kind of like an onion, right? Every layer you move forward, it gets a little bit bigger and richer and uh, more interesting. Uh, I think personally, um, aside from your two essays, uh, my favorite one in it was actually by... Um, Shalon, uh, when she offers just a scathing criticism of liberalism uh, from a kind of a Dornian perspective. I don't agree with a lot of it, but I thought it was a really interesting kind of take. Uh, and also, wasn't there an essay by uh, by Ben, your favorite, uh, Jason Brennan, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Jason Brennan, uh, who um, uh, actually uh, wrote a, uh, a response to the Cohen book that we were talking about. Uh, uh, so Brennan's, of course, was why not capitalism, uh, is um, uh, which uh, I, I have um, uh, she actually read just a little while ago. Really pissed me off. Uh, it's a it's it's a really it's a really badly you don't um, say <laughs> really badly argued book that like completely misses Cohen's point. Uh, but um, but yeah, and, and before I read any of his philosophical stuff, I knew I knew who he was because he was a uh, blogger for uh, there's a group blog called Bleeding Heart Libertarians, and he was uh, and, and he was he was uh, writing stuff about how uh, adjuncts uh, you know uh, demanded be paid more money and have more job security and benefits uh, are uh, you know shouldn't be listened to because because uh, they could all get jobs. I don't know exactly where he thought everybody could get jobs, but somewhere else. And uh, um, and uh, and anyway, there are better things that universities could do with the money, you know, than to pay to pay them more. And so, as a uh, adjunct at the time that that all this stuff came out, 
uh, you know, I, 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 I have a special spark of hatred in my heart, you know, uh, toward, towards that guy. But uh, have you ever read his uh, Against Democracy book, Ben? Uh, I've not read Against Democracy. The only two books that I read were uh, Why Not Capitalism and the one that you made me read about the, uh, the the libertarianism and introduction or whatever it's called. Yeah, everything yeah. you everything you wanted to know about libertarianism or something like that. Yeah. Well, I don't regret it because I enjoyed that conversation. But the Against yeah. Democracy book, it actually starts to get a little bit more obnoxious because he all but starts to say things like, I don't understand why an intelligent <laughs> – professorial individual such as myself should have to submit his activities to scrutiny by uneducated, less intellectually invested people as what we see in democracy. I just don't understand this, right? The elitism starts to come on a little bit more prominently with each book, I'd say. Uh, where it gets yeah, I'm not, time further up the totem pole. I'm not the biggest fan either, but I will say like like the I what I liked about that book was just like he the the depth with which he goes into sort of like the science of like human bias and I, and I do think that sometimes there's you know some questions that that us on the left could could be, could do make a little bit more of an effort to answer about like sort of like what's required of us as human beings like what kind of social change how engaged do we need to be in our politics you know and like like and and how much you know what kind of uh what kind of errors w might we make because i sometimes feel like you know as leftists we're like well once we you know get this system in place then then we'll you know create like what cohen calls you know his sort of like socialist culture where we'll care about caring about other people right and it's like and i think that looking taking a look at sort of like the the evidence on like the the you know the fallibilism of human beings uh, is at least one thing that i liked about that book but you're right for overall i didn't like the book yeah, and I will say, uh, I asked him to be participate in the collection, uh, both because I want us to have an alternative voice, uh, you know, somebody to be a bit of a foil, uh, so it wasn't just us ubiquitously saying, uh, liberal socialism is good, or socialism is better than liberalism, so let's just have that, right? I want at least one person who's going to be like, we're pro-liberal, classical liberal in the sense. Uh, but I do think he actually makes some fairly sophisticated arguments from an empirical standpoint as to why we should be skeptical of a kind of representative democracy. I don't ultimately buy it in the end for a lot of different reasons, right? Uh, but he does compel leftists to ask the question of what's intrinsically good about democracy and should it, whether it actually produce the kind of outcomes that we're expecting it to produce, right? Which is something, qua Victor, I think that sometimes we don't ask ourselves as often as we really should. Uh, there's just this kind of feeling that democracy and democratization are inherently good and they can't even really be questioned. Um, but I think they should. And going back to Plato, they happen from very sophisticated angles. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, I have mixed feelings here because on the one hand, I think, uh, um, you know, I mean, I do think all the questions you're raising are worth engaging in and they're worth their interesting things to say about them. But on the other hand, I always kind of hate that, like, ever since Plato thing. It's like, yeah, I mean, Plato hated poor people. What do you want? Like, that's, that's, that's not, that's not interested. Um, but, um, uh, yeah. So, uh, so Brennan, uh, so Brennan's essay in the book is a argument that socialism and liberalism are not compatible and, uh, and to, be fair, he doesn't. He doesn't do the thing that um, many people with his politics would do there, which is just to say, like you know, liberalism equals you know, classical liberalism equals libertarianism. Uh, that's that's the sort of usual argument. Um, you know, he he does take seriously, like okay, here's like a broader notion of liberalism that like socialists might not immediately reject, uh, but uh, but here's why he thinks that it would entail things that um, he doesn't think that socialist societies would produce. Uh, so uh, his example is open borders, that he says that um, if you believe in this sort of universal moral equality of everybody, that nobody deserves better or worse outcomes because of, um, you know, the... Uh, you know, being born into a certain caste or, you know, nobility or whatever, then sh the same thing should apply for what country you're born into. Nobody should have, you know, to, to pick an example, you know, that's, that's been in the news in horrible ways in recent days, you know, that like nobody deserves worse life outcomes because they're born in Haiti rather than Texas. Uh, so fair enough. I think he's right about that. 
Uh, and, and I also think he's right that a, uh, a just, uh, you know, like a just global society wouldn't restrict people's ability to, to move around as they, as they wanted to, right. You know, that they, uh, that, um, I mean, maybe you could say, you know, not a hundred percent, you know, you could come up with something, you know, that, that we'd accept as, as like a legitimate restriction, but like more or less, right. People could just move around as they pleased, you know, if, if you're not, you know, if, if you're not doing anything violent or bad, you know, that like, you know, you, you should be able to live, you know, live where you want to live. You know, we shouldn't say like, oh, you know, legally you can't, you know, live here without special permission. Uh, that that seems at the very least morally non-ideal, you know, if, uh, if you have that. Uh, okay, so far so good. But then he says that a socialist society uh, wouldn't, uh, couldn't, he thinks, uh, have uh, open borders or it's, I guess it's been a little while since I read his essay. I'm not sure if he goes quite as far as couldn't, or he just says that like he predicts that it would uh, have uh, have open borders. And uh, I, I think that's for a couple of reasons, but the uh, main reason, and again, I think you do have to give him a little bit of credit here because he's not uh, totally straw manning socialism. You know, he is he is honing in on on part of what socialists. Uh, would themselves say about what we mean by socialism it is he says, well, I hear so you, Ben. The exact quote is, uh, socialism cannot allow open borders and is therefore unjust. Uh, the three prompts of the argument, it's not possible to have genuine social societies with open border policies or with immigration policies close, uh, close to bo open borders. Two, justice, especially from either a left-wing egalitarian or liberal point of view, requires open borders or something close to them. Three, uh, therefore socialism is unjust and illiberal. That's the prongs of the argument. Yeah, so he says that the, the illiberal thing about socialism is that it would lead to people, uh, it would lead to immigration restrictions, possibly even immigration restrictions. Why does he think that, you ask? Good question. Uh, not obvious. Uh, well, he says that uh, because socialists want the whole economy to be like a giant workers' commune, uh, that uh, uh, the like incentives would be such that it wouldn't lead people to, you know, that like it, the whole society would have to approve uh, having new members join that giant commune. Uh, and he thinks that there would be incentives for, for them not to do so. So you wouldn't have to like dilute your share or whatever. And so he thinks that he thinks that in a democratic, like fully democratic socialist society, not just social democratic, uh, you you couldn't have open borders or something close to that. Whereas under capitalism, this is the kind of point that libertarians love. You only need, um, you know, all you need, uh, you know, you don't need everybody to, um, uh, at least in terms of the economic system, all you need is like one person to hire you uh, to, uh, to, to, you know, get a job in a new country after, after leaving the other one, you know, one person to like rent out an apartment to you. Uh, and I, I think that this is, um, I, I think the I think the sloppy part of the argument, like the main sloppy part of the argument, is that he's uh, is that he's being incredibly vague about about models of socialism. And I think the vagueness is important because uh, it, it makes it sound as if uh, there would be uh, that like all of these little decisions about hiring and housing and stuff would somehow be like, you know, that there would like all 280 million Americans would vote on them. Uh, and, and I don't really know anybody who, who advocates that, right? Like if, if you, um, I mean, if you're talking, I mean, if you think that like your idea of socialism is that it'd be totally moneyless, marketless, you know, advanced critique of the goth program thing, you know, most people who say that also imagine something stateless and borderless. Uh, but if you if you imagine something a little bit more grounded and easier to imagine how we can achieve anytime soon, where there would still be some market, you know, mechanisms and all of that, then, um, you know, some things would be uh, certain industries, you know, would be would be directly state owned, perhaps, and, and some along the lines of what Bhaskar talks about the Socialist Manifesto. Uh, would be, um, you know, like 
worker-owned firms financed by private, you know, by 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 public, you know, development banks, maybe. And if that was the case, then hiring would still be made at a firm level, just like ever, right? So, you know, maybe it wouldn't be true that you just need one capitalist to decide to give you a job, but you know, you'd only need like one firm to decide to give you a job, and that could be like twenty people, you know, maybe who have access, who are making that decision, even if every stupid little hiring decision is made by like the committee of the whole, which is probably realistically not how that would actually work. Uh, I hope not anyway, because I hate meetings and, and I, I want to live in a, you know, I don't want any form of socialism that makes me go to meetings all the time. Well, you know? we, can, we can always ask Nathan Robinson uh, what the best way of uh, running, running a firm is, right? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I you know, I think, um, yeah, I think I think Nathan has a history of, of making uh, implausibly extreme, uh, you know, comments about all hierarchies everywhere are bad, and you know, and and uh, uh, among all among other reasons why that was probably a mistake, uh, you know, he's, he's had it thrown in his face a lot, you know, in the last uh, in the last little while, but also like, come on, that's silly, like you can't have. Like, like you can't have like any sort of complex human enterprise without a certain level of operational hierarchy in practice. Like, you know, the, the society that's like one big open mass meeting all the time is a nightmare. Like, you know, like you, you do need to like delegate things and, you know, have there, there are even people with like specific managerial and technical talents. That's, that's fine. Right. They, they should just be democratically accountable. Um, you were, you know, any, anyway, so I, I think that, I think that, uh, that Brennan's, uh, the Brennan's like critique of, of how he thinks the incentives will work under socialism relies on an extremely vague idea of socialism. And I think the vagueness matters because I think once you start filling those details, it gets a lot less plausible. And then I think the other thing, like my bigger, my bigger objection uh, I have like an epic footnote grumbling about this. You know? I remember because you actually asked me if it could be maintained. You're like, no one's going to cut this footnote, right? I'm like, no, Ben, I can promise you as your editor that all the footnote will be incorporated if that's what needs to happen. I just make sure that every sentence of it is worthwhile because that is one fucking big footnote. It's, that, a, a it's not even a footnote. It's, you know, a fucking foot book. You know? page. Yeah, so so in my footbook, the other uh, the other the other point I make besides besides the straw manny vagueness of his idea of socialism is that um, I just don't think this is like a uh, defensible way of making predictions about how future societies would work. That you just like hone in on one incentive that people would have under that society and just treat it as decisive because real human societies are more complicated than that. Like, sure, like, let's say for the sake of argument, there is one incentive that might lead voters in this in this future society to, to have the views on immigration stuff that he says. Okay, I mean, there could be other incentives that go in the other direction. I mean, what if, like, you have a bunch of future socialist societies that have, like, gotten together into some sort of union that, you know, where, where like, you, you have free movement between all of them, and then, you know, you'd have to... Um, and then you'd have to choose between like, okay, maybe I don't want, you know, for the sake of argument, maybe I have some reason why I don't want to make it easier for people to come in mind, but I'd also like it to be easier for me and my kids to like go work in, in, in whichever, and that might lead them to, you know, maybe not, right? I mean, maybe people would vote to, you know, leave that, like Britain voted to leave the EU, but I mean, like it's, it's at least, you know, but that was also like a 50%, you know, like kind of decision. So, I mean, I, I think it's, I, I think just try to predict like, oh, here's exactly what voter behavior is going to be in this radically different kind of society, like in with three sentences. I, I just, I just don't think that's plausible. Yeah, I mean, I would put it uh, somewhat different way um, and try to argue against uh, the kind of convictions of nation state socialism, uh, something like what John Judas uh, would argue for uh, in a his book, The Socialist Awakening, right? Because uh, I do think that there are <laughs> socialists out there who will make the kind of arguments uh, for nation state socialism that excludes immigrants uh, or at least high levels of migration uh, in the way that Brendan's talking about. 
Uh, and it's a straw man to assume they speak for all socialists uh, or that their socialism is even distinctive, uh, since I think most socialists today are cosmopolitan. But let's uh, kind of look at the argument a little bit, right? Uh, and I think this is actually useful in talking about some of the themes of the book because there's also always been nation state oriented forms of liberalism and cosmopolitan forms of liberalism. Uh, and one of the things that's distinctive about nation state liberalism uh, is it usually adopts an attitude of Westphalianism for me uh, in the sense that our nation state borders are gonna be closed. We're gonna provide certain protections and rights to our citizens, but not allocate them to everyone else. Uh, but it's not gonna be Westphalianism for everyone else because markets are going, because our firms are gonna be allowed to interpenetrate into your countries. And if we need to adopt imperialist or neo-imperialist practices in order to open your country uh, to investment uh, or structural transformation or whatever the neologism of the day happens to be, then so be it, right? Uh, and Leo Panich and Sam Giddin talk about this in great detail in their book about the making of global capitalism and American empire, right? That United States is kind of distinctively Westphalian is liberalism involved a lot of isolationist rhetoric when it came to preserving its privileges uh, and a lot of interventionism when it came to the rest of the world. And one of the things I like about Brennan is he just says, let's just cut the bullshit uh, and admit that global capitalism is global capitalism. We should have open borders that will allow us to effectively more efficiently exploit labor uh, by allowing us to bring in cheap workers uh, who can pick grapefruits for us in California, and we can pay them pennies an hour and get a lot more from them for a lot less in this way, uh, and kind of strip away this veneer uh, that we live in a Westphalian society or a Westphalian global community anymore, right? Uh, I don't agree with that, but at least it's kind of stark in this way, right? And I do think that you can find nation state oriented versions of socialism that will argue we should kind of preserve our economic benefits for ourselves, organize ourselves, uh, as workplace uh, place democracies or a workers' cooperative uh, and exclude everyone else. But you'd find very, very few contemporary socialists argue for that, uh, both for principled and strategic reasons. The strategic reasons are if you're going to confront global capitalism, it is global capitalism, and that entails a coordinated response. Uh, and you can't just try to tackle it at one level or at the nation state level without trying to coordinate as members of a global left wing community to try to ultimately get rid of the root of the problem, right? wherever it happens to manifest. But I think the more principled argument is that socialists believe that our principles apply beyond borders. Uh, they're gonna take different forms depending upon where it is that you have to live. And that's good because diversity is good, right? Uh, but a socialism that says we're gonna preserve certain kind of economic entitlements for ourselves while excluding them to anyone, everyone else isn't ultimately a principled socialism, right? Uh, and to the extent we're committed to it as a moral project and a universalistic project, I don't think anybody uh, would be convinced that that's really all that compelling. Uh, and it kind of reminds me of Hegel's argument, uh, I think it was in a, The Science of Logic, uh, where he says, ultimately, uh, universalism is more radical than particularism because universalism demands to a certain extent that you ascribe the same status to everything uh, without exclusion or without prejudice or bias. Uh, and I think that in many cases, what we need to do as cosmopolitan socialists today is recover the radicalness of this universalistic spirit uh, and not give in to nation state temptations uh, that will give people like Brennan ammunition to hit us with. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I guess I'd also say that, um, I mean, just like brass tacks, clearly capitalism doesn't guarantee that you're going to have, uh, you can have open borders. Uh, you know, it, it exists pretty much everywhere in the world today, uh, and and it, it doesn't actually lead to that or, or or anything that close to it. I mean, like if, if the, I mean, it's it's possible that some like there might be some extra reasons for voters to prefer like illiberal outcomes and stuff like that in a future society, but you know that's that's really hard to know with any kind of certainty. And like also, even if it did, frankly, okay. Like, whatever. I mean, I, I would be in that society, I would be against it, right? I, I would be in the I would be in the let them all in political party, you know, within that future social society. But even if I lost that argument, that doesn't necessarily mean that the overall result is more illiberal. Uh, like, because, you know, I mean, there, there's certainly lots of ways in which capitalism leads to, to really illiberal results that, you know, no social society would, you know, that... Uh, or at least no social society in the sense of socialism as workers democracy that uh, if you have, uh, so like I think an example I use probably somewhere in the foot book is uh, that uh, like uh, prison labor, right? Like, you know, you, you can only get prison labor in a society where uh, 
you know, the people you employ don't get a vote in the management of the enterprise, you know, and, um, and, and so that's, that's something that's going to exist under capitalism and certainly wouldn't exist given, you know, given workers control, you know, so I mean, like the idea that like, here's one illiberal thing that maybe for the sake of argument would be more likely to exist in the society. Therefore the society as a whole is more objectionably illiberal. I think that's just way too much of a, of an inferential leap. Uh, but uh, we have, since this has come up a bit in the chat, uh, I see, and also uh, because uh, uh, I, I think it's like a big missing piece from our discussion so far, maybe in the in the last piece of it, you know, we, we could go a little bit more into the teeth of the other objection, right? So what, you know, we've been talking about, um, you know, the reasons why, uh some you know pro-capitalist liberals would deny that uh that that socialism is compatible even with a kind of broad philosophical sense of liberalism but we haven't really talked that much about why some socialists uh you know would object to it in, in the other direction or or not uh or not very directly I mean, the uh, so um you know because because there is a sort of view within like at least some currents of socialist thought that says that it's like uh, could be a little crude, but I don't think it's that much of a caricature, you know, like say, like, look, these are just like all these like formal, you know, bourgeois liberal rights, you know, free speech, blah, 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 you know, who cares really? Like it's, it's, it's not, that's, that's not, uh, uh, that's, that's not, that's not important. You know, what, what really matters is, you know, economic equality or what really matters is, you know, that the, the people are in control uh, and, and, and if anything, you know, this is just sort of, uh, you know, all of, all of that, like, um, all of that liberal stuff, you know, that, that, that you guys want to mix into, uh, into your socialism is, is just like, you know, it's, it's, uh, I guess the extreme version of this is like, it's, you know, like just stuff to make it easier for the CIA to undermine, you know, whatever yeah, social. It's funny that you said that because uh, actually like Plastic Pills, uh, he's got also like we d were on his podcast, but he also has his YouTube channel and he just recently re released this video about Project Cybersyn in Chile. I don't know if you if you guys had a chance to see it, but it was kind of like this this longer le like feature length almost documentary like that he that he was working on for several months, kind of like going over the story of what happened in Chile with like the coup. Um, and of course, Allende, for those of you who don't know, like he was kind of like broke the mold of like the different socialists at the time because uh he did try to do it like within the sort of existing political institutions and within like the the liberal rights that existed in chile and and with the elections the free and fair elections that happened but then he ended up getting undermined and just like what you were talking about ben made me think about seeing some of the reaction in the comments to his video like a lot of people who i'm assuming are kind of like more hardcore like like t tanky potentially communists like they took the lesson of the video to be like castro uh, was right and like you know because he was criticizing Allende a lot for like staying within and a lot of them saw the lesson of the thing as just like yeah like you have to have violence and you have to try to when you see an opening take the means of like the political institutions and like bring them under your iron fist because if you don't uh, you know the CIA and uh, the American Empire will just like take over and thwart any 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 efforts to do it within the framework of sort of like uh, like liberal democratic institutions. Yeah, I mean, in my experience, there are three arguments that you see uh, people putting forward uh, for why it is that liberalism and socialism are incompatible. And I'll go from uh, the worst that can be pretty easily dismissed to the best. And I'll try to be brief, right? Uh, though, as many people know, that's a problem for me, right? Uh, the worst kind of argument that I usually put, see put forward for why liberalism and socialism are incompatible is a, mostly, if you want to call it that, an aesthetic argument. Uh, the less sophisticated versions of it are liberalism is basically boring, uh, not radical enough without really any explanation of what's meant by that, uh, or too incrementalist. Uh, and the more sophisticated arguments are usually some kind of Sorelian longing uh, for a truly radical eventual moment, right? That's going to transform everything. And liberalism is seen as incompatible with that. And you can think back of George Sorel, you know, the myth of the general strike. And I think you still see iterations of this in people like Alain Bédieu, right? With this idea of an almost millenarian event uh, that's going to radically upset the ontological order of being somehow and bring us a common society that's not liberal, right? These kinds of aesthetic appeals really are very attractive to some people, uh, and they're more and less sophisticated versions of them, but I just don't think it's really all that compelling to reject or endorse a political doc uh, doctrine uh, 
And I want to stress that. It's not okay to endorse it either, purely on that basis, right? The fact that I think revolution is cool, and I do in many cases, right, isn't enough warrant for me to endorse revolution for its own sake. It has to be revolution or change for something in particular, right? Yeah. Uh, and that brings me to the more sophisticated argument that I see, which is that, well, liberal rights uh, are not enough, right? Uh, or they're just a mask uh, for giving the allure uh, or the illusion that there's social progress being made when really we're just getting more of the same. I think that there's usually something to this, right? Uh, and we all know different liberals out there. Michael Ignatieff is my favorite one to pick on, as Victor will know, uh, who will tend to cloak very reactionary sounding rhetoric and highfalutin liberal terminology about respecting human rights, which is why we need to invade Afghanistan or Iraq or whatever it happens to be, uh, or who will argue that really, you know, any kind of effort to go beyond the liberal representative democratic state is just going to entail too many risks. So we shouldn't do it, not because socialism is a good, but because it bears with it, you know, a lot of dangers. All of that, uh, I think is somewhat legitimate, right? Um, but also, you know, it's important to take note that many liberals would reject that and say, we do need to actually be quite radical uh, and try to innovate on the liberal representative democratic state. So those are the kind of liberalism that I would, uh, the liberalisms I would endorse. And they're the kind of liberalisms I'd like the left to deal with. The best argument that I can think of uh, against liberalism uh, is the one that broadly comes from what we might call the Marxist uh, tradition, going back to his essay, unfortunately entitled On the Jewish Question, right? Uh, which is that not only are liberal rights just kind of a smokescreen that gives off the illusion of progress, uh, but they're also predicated on a bad anthropology, right? One that sees us as effectively atomized individuals, each pursuing our self-interest uh, without regard for one another, uh, and liberal representative dem democracies and the ideologies that support them tend to engender the kinds of personalities that are appropriate to that moral outlook, right? People start to think of themselves as individuals purely motivated by self-interest, uh, and they don't really take a lot of concern or show a lot of concern for people around them or the environment. And I think you can see the apex of this with something like neoliberalism, which really tried to recreate people in its own image. That I think is actually a pretty compelling objection, right? Uh, and there's a lot of different flavors of it that we can go into. Uh, the way that I think we should respond to that is in part by doing what uh, Igor Shukadbrad did, our mutual friend, uh, Victor's and mine, uh, by showing that actually Marx himself, despite raising this critique of liberalism, had many kind of liberal inclinations. Uh, and I often point this out, right? Yes, it's absolutely problematic uh, to adopt this perspective of ourselves as islands just pursuing our self-interest. But I don't think anybody, would, if you really press them, who's committed to something like moral equality would say that we shouldn't have something like freedom of speech, or we shouldn't have something like freedom of religion, or we shouldn't have something like freedom to assemble, right? Uh, in fact, if anything, most of the radicals that I talk to say that the problem with these rights in the liberal democratic context is that they're not respected enough, that we need to go further in finding ways to respect them. Uh, and I'm all for that, but we should recognize that there are liberal roots to these kinds of inclinations. Uh, and many liberals share that kind of sympathy with us. Yeah, and uh, sort of putting a slightly different spin on it, I was just thinking about how I think that like a lot of the hostility against or you know, cre um, sp um, suspicion about liberalism is also just, I guess, very simply insofar as like socialism is committed to sort of like unalienated control, like or democratic control. It's like, I think that they sometimes you can see liberalism as, I mean, it is by design, like liberal democratic institutions is sort of like, um, you know, a limit on democracy, a limit on democratic control. So I think there can be that strain of socialism, which is hostile because it's like you're taking some fundamental questions outside the purview of like socialized control. Um, yeah, and, and I just want to add to that, um, spinning off Victor's point, I think there are some instances where liberals actually have some things to teach uh, socialists, democratic or otherwise, right? Uh, so one of the things that we can critical of when it comes to Marx's theory of politics uh, is that he does tend to have a very unitary vision of the state and political activity, right? Uh, in the sense that he sees any attempt to limit the power uh, of the state, and this is Bakunin's famous criticism, right? Uh, as in some senses, marginalizing or suppressing the will of the people, right? the real people, right? Uh, and, you know, there's, there's some truth to that, right? That any efforts to kind of curb the power of a democratic state is a restriction on democracy. But Irving Howe points out in his essay, Liberalism and Socialism, Articles of Conciliation, that there might be compelling reasons for us to want to do that, right? None of us want to be Socrates living in a pure democracy uh, where we're 
basically told to you know drink the hemlock or whatever it happens to be. Uh, most of us would respect the fact that having some individual rights that protect us from the exercise of undue state power is pretty valuable. Uh, and that insight is something that we owe to the liberal tradition, right? The idea that power should be not necessarily uh, broken up, uh, but at least contrasted with other kinds of power in order to prevent it from becoming concentrated and potentially posing a threat to those it's supposed to rule. I uh, can't hear you, Ben. Here we go. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, of those, right? So there's there's some there's some of those objections that are objections to um, uh, that are that are really about like the form of transition, which, which I, I I guess I would want to mark out as a slightly different question, right? Uh, like from from the question of what I mean, it's not unrelated, especially in practice, but I, I think that. I think that what you're trying to transition to and how you're transitioning there are at least like conceptually distinct questions. Uh, and, and certainly there have been, you know, I mean, liberal democracies are sometimes established by violent revolutions. You know, that, that certainly happens. Um, you know, but uh, I, I'd say that what, um, you know, what form of transition you end up with is as much as anything a function of like what kind of society you, you start out with uh, that uh, that you that like uh, I mean certainly if you go back and look at Marx and Engels's view on this uh, like in 1848 you know they they wrote you know where Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto uh, you know I, I think I think Engels you know, bought him cigars and brandy while he's doing it you know put his name on it after but you know the uh, and, uh, what did you say about the Young Marx movie recently like the vision of Marx and Engels is basically really smart grad students who like to drink and party. Is something I'm attracted to because it really conforms to my vision of how I want to think of them. I yeah, completely yeah. agree with you. When I watched that movie, I was like, fuck what I want to do to get a drink with Marx and Engels, right? Like, and if they told me like in Berlin, 30 minutes, you know, I'd be like, yeah, I'm there, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, but in 1848, you know, Communist Manifesto, they certainly see like armed insurrection as like the, the method of, of achieving socialism. Uh, Everywhere, but in, in 1848, even in Britain, the working class didn't have the right to vote. Uh, you know, there were all sorts of, you know, even there, there were all sorts of property requirements. And certainly continental Europe, it was like various kings and emperors uh, who, who were in charge. Uh, whereas later in the 19th century, you know, certainly before Marx died, uh, you know, like in, in like 1872, he gave this, uh, you can find it on Marxist.org, the... Uh, uh, one of his speeches to the First International, he kind of says, yeah, continental Europe, where that's still the case, uh, armed insurrection is the only way to get there. But, you know, Britain, sure, maybe like, you know, you could have a different sort of form of transition to socialism because at that point workers in Britain could vote. And he thought that maybe a socialist party achieving power electorally, you know, could uh, institute socialism that way. Although he was worried that uh, factory owners would respond to that the same way the plantation owners responded to the election of Lincoln, which, you know, Victor's talking about cyber sign, you know, and, and all that is, is a, you know, very legitimate concern. Like if you look at subsequent history, uh, but then on the question of like what it's a transition to, uh, I mean, I think there's the, there's the sort of individualism objection. Which, eh, it's not like, I think that I think that like it might conflate a couple of different senses of of uh, of individualism, uh, but then uh, but then I think the most interesting objection uh, is the one that you both mentioned about uh, you know restrictions on what what a democratic state can do are in some sense restrictions on on democracy, and I, I think that's probably the most plausible objection. I mean, it certainly captures. You know, I mean, some of the reasons why many socialists, you know, including, you know, I've said stuff like this, Matt has said stuff like this, you know, uh, Sam Boyd, certainly, you know, uh, that uh, who like have objections to judicial review, uh, you know, like like that's that's certainly the kind of thing that motivates that. But uh, but on the other hand, I, I think that what I would argue is. 
is, uh, you know, in the uh, in the remaining non-footnote section of the paper, I think I do argue, uh, is uh, is that like the ten percent of the paper that's not the footnote. Let's yeah, the ten percent of the paper that's not the footnote I've read it. The other ten percent, you know, one of the things I say is that I think that if you're interested in this relation, you know, thinking about this relationship between liberal rights and and so and democracy and socialism, well, if if you see the point of socialism as being the extension of democracy to the economy, which is certainly where this objection comes from that, you know, that restrictions on what the democratic state can do are, are, are undemocratic, uh, then I think you need to think about what is necessary for people to meaningfully democratically participate. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is where like, you know, you kind of have to put down the philosophy books and start looking at like what's actually empirically happened in like actual historical revolutions and, and I, I think based on that track record, I'm extremely suspicious of the idea that you can have meaningful democracy in the workplace or anywhere else uh, in a state that doesn't pretty robustly protect some like core liberal rights. I mean, it, I mean just just to, to put the put, put the objection really like bluntly, uh, you know, if you're worried that you say that you might get hauled off by the secret police if you say the wrong thing, you know, you're probably not going to speak up at the mass media to advocate, you know, your own views. And pretty soon, you know, the mass media is going to be a rubber stamp, you know, for whatever, like the leadership wanted to do all along. You know, I mean, this is what uh, Rosa Luxemburg talks about in, in her uh, uh, critique of the Russian Revolution in, in, uh, in 1918, you know, when she says you're going to lose the sort of energies of the masses because all the decisions are going to be made by like 10 party officials from behind their desks. Uh, you know, which I think turned out to be prophetic. I mean, in, in, in 1918, you know, about uh, about what actually happened, and, and so I mean, if if you're if what you really want is democracy is ruled by the people, I mean, conceptually maybe that can come apart from 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 like robust protections of things like free speech rights, but I'm very skeptical that it can come apart in practice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and one of the things that I point out in my paper is that even when it comes to the strongest objection, uh, which I think is this objection about liberalism having what we might call a bad anthropology, right, of atomized individuals, really applies only to the most stringent forms of possessive individualist liberalism, which I should say are still very prominent, right? You can see it with neoliberalism in spectacular kind of form, right? Uh, and that has deep roots in the worryings of people like Locke, right? And Robinson Crusoe, who Marx famously criticized, right? This idea that even if you were on an island, you'd still be a good bourgeois individual, you know, taking note of what you were doing over the course of the day and recording, you know, how many hours you worked and whatever it happens to be, right? That's all fine to criticize and we should, right? Uh, but I think there's a deeper sense in which both socialism and a kind of egalitarian liberalism are both individualistic. Uh, but in a sense, that doesn't preclude respect for the other. Uh, and here, I'll just make a commentary about the relationship between two people who probably would have hated each other if they met in real life, you know, Marx and John Stuart Mills, right? Uh, the early Marx, uh, when he makes kind of moral arguments, says, you know, the free development of each is a condition for the free development of all, uh, in the sense that in order to fully develop our personalities uh, and express them, uh, we require a kind of other-centeredness. Uh, so to be other indiv true individualists, we need someone else, right? Very Hegelian idea. That's not a foreign notion to someone like John Stuart Mills, uh, who also argues that to develop yourself uh, is the highest good, but it's not just the highest good for you. It's the highest good because the experiment of living that you engage with is of great utility to everyone else around you, uh, both the people who care about you and who will benefit from knowing that you're happy and from those who will look to you as an example for the kind of life that they can lead. And they want to know if you have any information in your life that might be of use when they're trying to plot out what they should do with theirs, right? So there's a lot of complementarity there between the kind of expressive individualism you find in someone like Mills uh, and the kind of, I'll just call it broadly, Hegelian individualism that you find in someone like Marx, right? Uh, and if we want to have a dialogue about the moral impetus of socialism and liberalism uh, around the question of individualism, that's where I think we should start to talk about there being quite a few links between the two. Uh, and what's interesting to both of them is Mill, in his essay, Socialism, is really emphatic about rejecting possessive individualism. So this notion that we're all islands is just completely ridiculous. Uh, and only somebody who believes in fairy tales could hold to it. And Marx believes exactly the same thing. Right? Yeah. And um, 
I'll also say just about um, in terms of the democracy objection uh, to socialism, you know, I'll, I'll plug my my paper in, in the book, too, which I've actually, you, you know, if you want to get more details on it, Ben and I did do an episode where we talked about it. But uh, I was actually Sortition, interested. Right? Yeah, sortition, like because because I think I'm interested in. Um, sort of finding uh, a mechanism of enhancing the sort of like democratic legitimacy and democratic participation that I think like socialism requires, but that can still exist within like a liberal framework, but also doesn't require the thing that I know uh, Ben and I both hate, uh, which is like, you know, endless meetings. And of course, something that Zizek talks about, you know, that, you know, he doesn't want, he wants the good kind of alienation where the stuff can be done in the background and he can keep reading his books and, and make, and watching his movies. And, and, you know, I feel similarly. So I, uh, so yeah, I, I sort of argue that the sortition could be an interesting um, method for enhancing d democracy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so yes, uh, as uh, as Victor says, uh, you can can watch uh, the the whole episode uh, that we did uh, talking about that and and going into um, uh, going into the the post game. You know, I think we think we spent a good few hours talking about uh, sortition. Uh, felt like like Kale, uh, you know, who, who was filling in as the producer at that point. I, I, I feel like Kale was like maybe half convinced. You know, by mm -hmm. the end, that's the uh, that's the sense that I got. Um, but not, uh, not you though. What's that? Not you though. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm probably pretty pretty dogmatic <laughs> about uh, you know about democratic participation. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I I definitely think you made an interesting. Um, uh, you know, an interested argument, you know, for, uh, you know, for, for sortition. I mean, I've, I've, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got, I've got my objections and whatnot, but I, I think it was all, I think there are definitely some dents, you know, and, uh, you know, my, my opposition is, is like a, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's like a car that's still running, but you can tell it's been through some shit, you know, it's, right. uh, you know, it's I'll so. take it. I'll take it. Fair enough. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll to be it. fair to you, Ben, you know, on the pill pod, we very rarely have somebody who even says, you know, we're moderately convinced, or at the very least, you know, our cars, you know, have been a little bit beaten up by their arguments. So the fact that you're willing to concede that, I think, is is something. It's not what I'm used to anymore. Right? <laughs> Usually, it's uh, kind of this Lutheran model of like, here I stand, God rest my soul, I can do no other, right? You know, not moving a goddamn inch on anything. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, so all right. Uh, so yeah, do uh, do check that out by your means. Uh, I will also say uh, that um, uh, that uh, nice little Spinal Tap reference there. Uh, so um, say that uh, that the you know you, you mentioned uh, that uh, that Marx and Bill would have would have hated each other if they actually met, which is probably true. Uh, I think actually in uh, I was just reading this in uh, a GA Cohen book that I did not have handy to to, to whip out from the, the shelf behind me. Uh, Karl Marx's theory of history uh, that uh, that I, I think he quotes in like Capital somewhere. Um, the uh, yeah, uh, I think Marx does uh, does take a pot shot at something that Bill says about economics somewhere. And uh, Cohen argues that that, that Marx uh, is like being super uncharitable about uh, about the, like the word choice of what Will say. You know, Bill says that they probably don't actually disagree with each other. You know, nearly as much about the point as uh, as as Marx uh, Marx thinks they do. But, um, but yeah, I should say, even David Harvey uh, said in his book Reading Capital, and David Harvey loves Marx, rightfully so, right? But he's like. Every now and then, Marx is maybe a little less charitable to the people he doesn't like than he should be. Right? Well, I mean, it, it, it fits with my preferred mental image of of of, of Marx and Engels as you know, as as like extremely clever graduate students who drink a lot. You know that, like you know, that, like sometimes they, you know, I mean, like I've, I've known a lot of guys like that. Sometimes they just get into their heads that they hate someone, and you know, everything is, <laughs> you know, everything is filtered through that. So, um, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> Should uh, should say by the way uh, that uh, that on uh, on the subject of the Cohen book that uh, that I just mentioned, uh, 
uh, for uh, for anyone who uh, who wants to hear a lot more about that. Uh, uh, teaching a class at the uh, Michael Albertson School for Social and Cultural Change in uh, October and November uh, about uh, about that book. Uh, you know, going going through it point by point should be a lot of fun. Class is called Analytic Marxism: and Materialist Theory of History. Go to SSCC. So School for Social and Cultural Change, sscc.teachable.com. Uh, 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 it's, uh, it's possible. Uh, this is a uh, email that, that I, I owe everybody, actually, uh, that, uh, that Matt will be teaching there. So, so something there, too, at some point. Uh, I really hope he does. Uh, but um, don't, don't buy this book. Uh, you know, have your library buy it. But, uh, but do read it. As the editor, I endorse that message. Yeah, uh, don't buy it if you can, uh, unless it goes on sale uh, or unless you have money to burn. But 100% get your library to get a copy, and I would very much appreciate that. And I know most of the authors would as well. Fair enough. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, got anything uh, you want to plug before we go? Uh, well, you and I, Ben, had that article on Levin's book uh, that's supposed to come out relatively soon, American Marxism, uh, yeah, and I, I do know. want to, yeah, and I do want to plug that since I start. I think it opened. Like this one either. Yeah, it opened with one of my best and cleverest lines ever. You know, it's a real Shakespearean uh, kind of observation, uh, and it was American Marxism is the worst book that I've ever read. Uh, and that was an honor I had previously reserved for Atlas Shrugged. So for the fact, the fact that you know something was able to push Ayn Rand off the crown position is, well, it was uh, it was quite impossible. I thought it I mean, was impossible. But it's also worth mentioning that you've you've read a lot of trash too, Matt. I mean, you've you've yeah, you've, 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 you've built a nice little like a, a little mini career here, like like reviewing all these garbage well, conservative books. I read yeah, this, I, and I, I kid I, you not, I sat there thinking. God, Ben Shapiro is such a fucking interesting, honest, intelligent reader of the leftist tradition. I just wish I was reading, you know, How to Destroy America in Three Steps because it was such a smart, savvy read. Uh, that was the point that I was pushed to reading this. Like, so I wanted to actually compare it at one point to trash, but then I actually thought to myself in true Rawlsian form, that's really unfair to garbage which is purely garbage for morally arbitrary reasons. It shouldn't be discriminated against by being compared to American Marxism. So I'm not gonna make that comparison. Leave the so, garbage alone, don't compare it to Levin's book. So to be clear, you've read Don't Burn This Book by Dave Rubin. I have, yes. And again, I wanna point out that that was fucking Oscar Wilde next to American Marxism. Like at least Don't Burn This Book had a really unfunny joke about how if J Dave Rubin had a vagina, it would be a huge vagina, that I got some joy by making fun of it. This book not only didn't have those kind of joys, but again, was something akin to a war crime against the mind, but I haven't come up with the terminology for it yet because the horror of it was just so abyssal that even characterizing it as a war crime seems to do it disservice to the radicality of the experience. I don't know. I'll find a new terminology by creating a neologism. Who knows? Levin, it's Levin-esque. That's what I'll leave it at at this point. All right. So what I'm getting out of this is that American Marxism uh, by Mark Levin was okay, not great. Yeah, yeah. P pick it up. But anyway, <laughs> you and I have a review of that coming out soon, Bren. I'm very excited about it because I think it'll be very interesting to see what people's response to it is because if – it does not discourage you to read that book. From reading that book, I really don't know what will. Fair enough. All right. Uh, thanks, guys. So uh, we just uh, to plug what's coming up here. Um, just, uh, on uh, Thursday, uh, Brent Langwell's going to be back. Uh, we are going to be watching... Uh, Vosh's debate with, uh, with, with Charlie Kirk uh, for uh, the Thursday night debate breakdown uh, since uh, that, is, uh, that is homework now since, since I'm going to uh, be debating Kirk a week from Friday uh, in, uh, in Arizona. So that's, that's, uh, that is coming right up. 
Uh, so uh, doing that on Thursday, probably going to be a pretty long one since, since we're going to try to get through it, uh, you know, Thursday night. Uh, and it was, it was not a short debate. And on Monday, we have uh, Vivek Chibber uh, on, uh, on the main show. Uh, so uh, lots, to, uh, lots to look forward to. Uh, have your library uh, by uh, liberalism and socialism, mortal enemies are a bitter kin. And I'm probably going to leave it there.